Hi, everybody logged on here. Um, and thank you to all at involved at Dance Cult for inviting me to be part of this auspicious occasion of the first uh, or the inaugural Dance Cult conference. Uh, this really means a lot to me and uh, to be part of this. My name is Moses Eaton, and my presentation today is called The DJ as Researcher Approach Methods Emerging Through Digital Cumbia Fieldwork. In this super short presentation today, I'll first introduce myself and then digital cumbia and sound system culture. I'll then talk about my, my methodology, which is ethnographic fieldwork and digital ethnography based on a practice led DJ as researcher approach, of which I'll show some examples. I'll conclude with some thoughts on the contribution a DJ as researcher approach uh, can make to music research more broadly. As well as a PhD, so I'm a PhD candidate at RMIT um, in Melbourne, Australia. I'm a professional DJ producer with, with a practice of more than 15 years. And the image on this slide is from a gig in Yaoundé in Cameroon in 2017, where I performed as Cumbia Cosmonauts, which is my main music project. My presentation today is about how my DJ practice informs the methodology of my research as a scholar. Um, next, I'll introduce you to the musical context of my research. Cumbia is in music, so digital cumbia and sonidero sound system culture. Cumbia is a music from the Caribbean coast of Colombia and has been celebrated as the musical synthesis of the Colombian nation. Uh, folklorists and many scholars consider cumbia as mestizaje, the blending of African, indigenous, American and European cultural elements. Digital cumbia first came to global attention by the releases of the hit CCK records label based in Buenos Aires, Argentina, who popularized what some scholars have called the first Latin American genre of electronic dance music. And this was in the mid 2000s. According to this narrative, digital cumbia is an invention largely credited to this particular group of DJs, producers from the middle class and elite parts of Buenos Aires who first used EDM with cumbia. However, I researched digital cumbia not as a genre, but as a process and argue that the roots of digital cumbia are in cumbia sonidera or sound system cumbia, which emerged as a popular music uh, over several decades um, and became well the digital version of cumbia sonidera emerged in the 1990s um, and in, in the sonidera sound system culture of the barrios or ghettos of Mexico. I'll now show you how the sound has evolved by playing uh, you fragments of several versions of a song Cumbia Samposana, which many sonideros consider the mother of all cumbias. Um, to do this, I have to, I want to play some sound. Hang on a second. Actually, So first, let me like play a Colombian recording from the 1940s and uh, the late 1940s in which you can hear accordion and African percussion instruments. <laughs> Next, an early 2000s version of synth-driven digital cumbia sonidera, Mexican sound system cumbia, performed here by the legendary sonido, sonidero sound system operator, operator La Changa. <laughs> And finally, a version from my own Kumbi Cosmonauts project recorded in 2013. So 
I'm just going to share, go back to my PowerPoint now, if it works. Um, yeah. I can see why Graham did a video, but bear with me. The rest of it will be a little bit more simple. Okay. This slide shows a Sonidero sound system operator performing at an event in a barrio ghetto of Puebla, Mexico. I'm showing this image to give you a sense of how this local ghetto culture is global, also global. Each pole with a light uh, and video camera attached represents one of the hugely popular YouTube channels, which have thousands of subscribers and millions of views. Some of these channels stream live and others will later post particular highlights for an audience of millions who engage with the culture via social media. This audience are mostly undocumented Mexican workers in the US, where they are, they are often separated from their families and communities for years. My methodology is practice-led, and I'm calling it a DJS researcher approach. This approach recognizes what hip-hop scholar Joseph Schloss called experience-based knowledge, and sound system scholar Julian Henriquez has explored as different ways of knowing, acquired through an informal apprenticeship. The DJS researcher approach has several aims. Uh, for example, contributing to a new language, which, according to ethnomusicologist Michael Veal, addresses the qualities of this music on its own terms. Bill did this by focusing on production techniques and sonic properties in his seminal, seminal study of Jamaican dub music, whilst I'm paying more attention to what a DJ evaluates in a pre-performance context. This includes the mix and engineering of the music, of course, but also tempo and extra musical details such as cover art. There's not enough time to go into more detail of analyzing music recordings using this approach today, but I'll, I'll talk about um, how social media emerged as one of the most prominent aspects of the DJ as a researcher approach. So in, in this digital age, and even more so with all the physical restrictions due to COVID, um, there are various ways of being in the field physically, but also through engagement, online engagement remotely via email and chats, etc., and imaginatively via streaming, for example. In digital ethnography, the internet is not engaged with as a separate virtual identity uh, entity but as inseparable inseparable from the physical field work um at, at these images here of the physical field work that happened in 2019 just before the pandemic top left on the slide here i'm posing with the sonidero sound system operator gabriel duenas after an interview on his rooftop in monterey mexico and top right shows an image of several sonideros on that same rooftop some months later with which I engage remotely via live stream on Facebook. And bottom left, I'm gathering or digging uh, CDR mixtapes of digital cumbia. And then bottom right, uh, you can see those CDRs being analyzed back in Melbourne. These research activities show the ongoing interplay of physical, remote, and imaginative fieldwork sites, which correspond with the context of my research participants, who are all DJs active on social media. And uh, here is a map of cumbia roots and my field work, uh, which shows the roots of cumbia as revealed through interviews I've done. It also marks my physical field work sites in Mexico, Colombia, and Argentina, um, starting with recordings from Colombia uh, across the Americas in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, cumbia, uh, that's cumbia recordings. Then from Peru in the 1970s and 80s, uh, and then Cumbia Solidera from Mexico during the 1980s and 90s, and finally Cumbia Villera from Buenos Aires in the 2000s. That's that's the root of Cumbia via recordings. And this map is, is different because it is about digital Cumbia roots, which as you can see connects the whole world, not just the Americas. The various locations shown are some of the places where digital Cumbia is being produced, and also shown are the sites where I did physical field work, again, and the locations which, which I researched remotely, such as interviewing someone based there. And you can see it extends, for example, I also did field work in Berlin. Um, using the hashtag Cumbia Research, I communicate my research to the broader public via my social media channels on Facebook and Instagram, 
which have been built up over several years as part of my DJ practice. These posts also add to the DJ producer profiles of the research participants. Um, this can be seen as a way of give, giving back or reciprocity and as building rapport and convincing my peers of the value of research. On this slide, you can see some examples of my posts showing research uh, participants. Because of my hashtag Cumbia Research posts on social media, I was contacted via Facebook by Sonidera, who invited me to Tepito, one of the most notorious barrios of Mexico City. So it also helps in recruiting, in some cases, research participants. On the top left slide here, you can see me interviewing the legendary Sonido Caribali, known as the King of Bass. This image is a still from a live broadcast by the Facebook page of a sound system chronicler called Rosa Chula, who was there and, uh, and filming, filming the interviews. On the right is what I framed in my camera, and Caribali is sitting in front of bass things, behind which is a huge shelf of records. Bottom left is a still from another live broadcast by Rosa Chula on her Facebook page uh, of the Sonideros chatting before my arrival. And that, that was, was very useful to watch that after, after obviously um, I'd gone back home and I realized she'd done that. Bottom right is Solidero Pato explaining some techniques uh, on his customized Gerard 1950s Gerard turntable. I main interview with him was also broadcast by Rosa Chula. And in, in this way, data gathering became part of the way Sonidero culture documents itself and vice versa. I gained extra insights from the responses to these broadcasts. Instead of seeing myself as a re researcher gathering raw data to turn into scholarly knowledge, the DJ's researcher approach is collaborative revealing and allowing the interaction of what Julian Henriquez refers to as different ways of knowing. Also in Mexico City, I agreed for my interview with sound system cumbia producer Angel Pedraza to be streamed via his Grupo, Grupo Qual Facebook page. It was viewed live by 6,500 people, making hundreds of comments, to some of which Pedraza responded during the interview. The post was shared 61 times and got 317 likes and of course this is still live and, and still being interacted with. Very revealing for me were the comments from their followers all over the world and on the slide here for example you can see someone from Argentina asking when Grupo Qual are going to be performing the Cathedral of Cumbia there, the Tropi Tango Club. The deep connections between Mexican and Argentinian ghetto Cumbia has not been mentioned by any scholars and these type of online interactions gave me plenty of evidence which I also verified through physical fieldwork. In the city of Puebla, where I had interviewed an influential local producer and went to sound system events, I was then invited in, a, in return by a promoter to perform my own music on his Facebook video channel, which streams live DJ performances. This has been a common Sonidero practice from before the pandemic and allows the millions of undocumented workers in the US, as well as people in jail, for example, to connect with their families and communities via a live event, albeit online. The former DJ set, the host of La Gargola Sonidera TV, interviewed me about my research in Puebla and the stream got over 4,000 views and 100 something comments and 52 shares and heaps of follow-up messages uh, were then, you know, uh, sent to me via my social media channels asking about my research. And this particular experience wasn't planned as part of my research originally, but being a DJ as a researcher, I was able to give back to the Sonidero culture I've been researching in, in doing this performance. And being a public broadcast on the social media it went a long way to make my research relevant in, in this very particular ghetto context. There are several DJ driven documentation projects with which I feel compelled to be collaborating uh, in order to engage with ways of knowing which have much to bring to the research of electronic dance music and DJ cultures. The DJ's research approach has allowed my research to find rapport and engagement from ghetto-based DJs, as I've tried to illustrate with examples in this presentation. It has also allowed my research to be well received by the DJ's producers from outside the barrio, the ghetto. For example, the hip label CCK Records that I mentioned in the introduction, who have been hyped around the world as inventors of the digital cumbia genre, invited me to provide some critical historical context for a series of podcasts on their, on their own history which were broadcast live on YouTube as shown on the slide here. 
Um, also, I've recently had a peer-reviewed article published on the roots of digital cumbia as being in ghetto-based sound system culture. I also see contributions to DJ-driven documentation projects, such as this example, as a contribution to knowledge as research with impact. And this is something that uh, was 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 already happening before the pandemic when I was doing my field work, and but it had as absolutely exploded uh, in this particular in, in, the, in the cumbia world um, since then because people people are still in the culture and. Um, and it becomes a way of staying connected, which has obviously been mentioned quite a few, by quite a few presenters today. Uh, class, and to conclude, class is a deeply device is deeply divisive in Latin America, and identity-based definitions of cumbia dominate scholarship on cumbia. Cumbia as digital, as electronic, and technology-driven usually comes up in relation to DJs producers from outside the ghettos, whilst those based in the barrios, the ghettos, are perceived as working in folk and popular music. To illustrate this divide, this tension here on this slide, you can see a Sonidero sound system street dance uh, in Mexico City on the left where Cumbia is played. Next to it is a cover of the CD compilation from Argentina, CCK Sound Volume 1, Cumbia Digital, which upon its release in 2008 launched digital Cumbia as a genre of electronic dance music. The socio-political and cultural tensions in particular genres and scenes are of course explored by many popular music scholars, but by focusing on music as a process, and the specific role of DJs has allowed me to go beyond identity-based definitions. Whilst in this presentation today, I've presented a specific example of research on digital cumbia based on my particular experience as a DJ producer, I believe there is potential for broader scope in popular music studies for methodologies informed by a DJ's researcher approach. The ways of knowing and experience-based knowledge of DJs are worthy of further emphasis in a scholarly context. Thank you for listening and I look forward to hearing your questions and thoughts and also hear my references for anyone who wants to check up on something. I'll just stop sharing. Okay. Thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Uh, let's see if we have some questions. So I've got one question, it might sound a bit naive, but uh, do you think that digital cumbia is taking over, uh, let's say, traditional cumbia in urban spaces or contexts? Is it something which is nowadays more popular or more frequently? Is I think it's a very good, good question um, that hadn't really occurred to me, actually. But it's uh, one of the reasons um, the sound system, the ghetto sound system scene uh you know like you saw some of the people that i um that i interviewed they're elderly gentlemen there's one particular guy who started his sound system in 1958 and still active and they're using 1950s turntables so these guys don't play digital cumbia because they just play what's available on vinyl it's it's very diverse in terms of the traditional sound system the ghetto sound system context uh particular djs or particular sound systems will specialize in, in particular sounds but i wouldn't say that digital cumbia is taking over by any means so in, in some ways there's some sort of comeback with the whole vinyl vinyl you could say vinyl fetish in a way like vinyl is being hugely valued just in the last five to ten years um and you know fetching huge prices and mexicans going to colombia to buy up whatever there is from the 1950s releases etc um yeah but meanwhile there's the other the other world which is the sort of more club club world of touring djs um, who, who, you know, performed the, the, the genre of digital cumbia, which um, arguably has, has, has pretty much died as a genre. Meanwhile, those producers are still active in electronic music, going in different different sort of genre directions. But when you put them in a studio and I interview them, like cumbia, was, most of them was their starting point, and it's still, it's still a deep connection there. But yeah, there's only so right. much I can cover in the 15 minutes. Um, uh, but but I think you really hit on something like one of the reasons I'm really excited to be part of this is to be talking about something like cumbia in a context of electronic dance music as opposed to a more traditionally ethnomusicological context of you know it's folk music and maybe popular music or what does that mean popular music you know right to get more specific and look at it as electronic dance music. Thank you Thanks. for the answer. 
And let's just take one more question. Uh, so I would like to know where your enthusiasm from Cumbia comes. Being Mexican myself, it surprises me to see an Australian so involved. And do you think that your foreign gringo origins have influenced your ethnography? Gracias, Cesar. Um, yeah, look, uh, I realized after I should have maybe introduced myself a bit more, but as I said, squeezing everything into 15 minutes. Um, yeah. uh, so I, I lived in Mexico as a 20 year old. I grew up in a working class background between Switzerland and Tasmania and uh, ended up in Mexico as a 20 year old and, and lived there for a year and a bit. And, and then in that time, got to love the music and came back and basically launched my own DJ and production career with Cumbia. <laughs> so I've been doing that since I was 20 years old and, and, and I'm now, you know, this is half my life. And I've been touring constantly around Latin America and very involved, even though I'm based in Australia, which is a bit weird. And, but it does help me, I feel, especially now that I'm a researcher, not just a DJ going to Mexico and Latin America, um, I'm a bit of an oddity. And it really helps me, for example, cut through some of the class barriers was I walk in there as a blonde, blue-eyed dude, the gringo, uh, guerito, um, and, and the class barriers are huge. So, but I'm, I'm going to places where a lot of the locals don't end up going to because because of the class barrier. But I'm a foreigner and I sort of, I can get away with it. And obviously Thank I need you. to have a lot of contacts and stuff to make it happen. Thanks. Thanks.